Yeah, we were um, just freestyling there. And yeah, that's... I like that. I like freestyling. Freestyling's good. Um, I did want to talk about something that you sent me. You sent me a message this week. You yeah. sent me a clip of John John like just paddling in his wave super easy. And then you're like, dude, look how easy he's paddling in his wave. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty wild. And literally an hour before that, somebody else had sent me a clip of Kolohe at lowers doing like basically the same thing, paddling in with just incredible ease. It was the most hilarious coincidence. And I was like, oh, I think that might be the universe uh, saying that we should talk about this, about getting into waves. And, and, and I know in episode one, and here's a shameless plug to go back if you haven't listened to that or watched that, go back to episode one and listen to how we're talking about how fast you need to paddle to get into waves. We talked in that, that we would continue that discussion a little bit, and I think we should probably do that. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, cool. So um, I'm, I'm going to actually just tell you the answer outright. Last time you were like, oh, how fast do we need to go? Just enough, right? That was kind of your answer, which is great. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more scientific with how fast you have to move to catch the wave. And last time we talked about how paddling itself doesn't get you to the speed that you need to catch a even a two foot wave moving into the beach. You can't go, you can't paddle fast enough. There's a limit to how fast we can paddle, uh, even on longboards. So we need other forces involved in order to get us up to that speed. So that's what we kind of determined. We talked about ramps and gravity and, and all sorts of th stuff. The bottom line is, is that any every single surfer needs to get to planing speed so you need to go from displacement to planing <laughs> so that's pretty much the answer right there end of show what do you think, do <laughs> what do you think man? <laughs> do, you, do you know what planing planing is jim um <clears throat> Normally I'd say yes, but you got me nervous to answer. Well, give me give me your answer. <laughs> what do you think planing is? A planing is essentially um, riding on top of water versus plowing or moving, displacing water. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Um, so planing is actually surfing, and surfing is actually planing. Like we're not we're not displacing water so much as skimming on top of the water or sliding on water um, and it's it's really important to understand the differences between displacement and planing so that you have a better idea of what it feels like to go from displacement to planing so a, a, a more formal definition a displacement vessel because we're a vessel as soon as we get on our on our surfboard we are a the surfboard is a vessel but we our body plus the surfboard is the vessel. So a displacement vessel is one that pushes water down and around itself, and it actually um, displaces water. That's why they call it displacement. Whereas a planing, as opposed to a planing vessel, a planing vessel basically just skims on top of the water, just like we were, what you were saying. It just skims across without much of the body um, in the water. It's mostly clear of the water, so pretty much like that. And there's this really, really cool Greek mathematician. <laughs> of course, I'm going to bring a mathematician into this. But it was a really cool Greek mathematician named Archimedes, who we have to thank to better understand displacement. Um, he was a Greek mathematician and inventor and scientist. And he really was the first one to claim that uh, an object in, a, in water or in a fluid specifically, it's... It's acted upon by a force, an upward or buoyant force uh, going up, uh, up towards it as it pushes down. And the magnitude of that upward force is equal to the weight of the fluid uh, displaced by the object. All right. So in essence, the water that you displace is uh, in, in the weight of that is the upward buoyant force. Now we're dealing with buoyancy all the time. So a good, a good example of this is if if you were to launch a ship into the water, so it's the ship is going to come into the water and it's going to sink down to a point at which 
it equals the weight of the ship. So the, the amount of water displaced by the ship equals the weight of the ship itself. And as you load that ship with more weight, it's gonna sink lower and the amount displaced is gonna equal the weight of that additional, uh, of, of, of the whole entire ship, everything together. So like, you know, when we go boat surfing, we are actually not trying to get to plane on the boat. We want to displace water. And that's why we put a ton of weight in that thing because we want to create this wave that pushes us as surfers without the line, right? So that thing's just plowing through. Um, and in surfing, we talk a lot about the volume of the board. We talk about volume of the board for paddling and for riding. So it, it, this is directly correlated to Archimedes principle that we just talked about. So what's really we should be talking about more so than volume just outright. It should more so be the weight to volume ratio, the weight of the surfer versus the volume of the board. That's really what we should focus on when we talk about volume of boards, because that's the combinations, the combination of you and the board that creates that vessel in the water um, and displaces that vessel. And it's that combination that we need to get to planing in order to catch the wave. So I think um, a great resource for people uh, listening or watching is uh, Surf Simply's uh, Harry Knight, super awesome coach down in Costa Rica. He did a post on weight to volume ratio for different progressions in surf skill level. And they've been kind of refining this guide over the years. It's a great guide to kind of take a look at to see, you know, what size board volume wise versus my weight and my skill level should I maybe be directing my attention to. Um, so if you, I think if you just Google surf simply weight to volume ratio or Harry Knight surf to uh, weight to volume ratio, um, you'll find it. Um, it's a great, great link. So uh, big, big shout out to them. And I hope they're doing well down in uh, Costa Rica. Um, but, um, so, so anyway, that's Archimedes principle. He talks about objects being at rest. Now, once we start moving, Archimedes, the buoyancy still acts that way, but now we're adding in a couple more items of physics, specifically lift. And as we start to move, we might go from say, um, displacement to maybe semi-displacement where there's lift involved and now we're getting a little bit higher out of the water but we're not quite clearing the water right um, and and then eventually with enough speed it turns into a planing vessel um, so there, there's a lot to this um, if we're if we're trying to simplify catching a wave you just need to get to planing speed and a lot of people think well how how hard is that right it's not that hard at all but in order to kind of really understand it, uh, we have to learn about waves. The waves that we actually have to talk about to, to better understand what, you know, going from displacement to planing are not the waves that we see and we surf, but they're the waves that we actually create from moving through water. Um, so a lot of people don't think about this, but, but a boat's a great example. When a boat moves through water, it creates waves right behind it, right? Well, when we move through water, we create waves as well. And that's, um, as, as we move through water, we're pushing aside that water. And that water needs to go somewhere because water doesn't compress. It needs to go somewhere. So typically when we displace water as we're moving through it, it typically will go up, right? And it'll create what's called uh, a bow wave. And I've talked about this a lot in level one, the bow wave um, adds drag, it slows us down, um, it's really not good. And there's ways to, to, to minimize that. But basically it creates this bow wave. And the bow wave, you can think of waves as like the sign, trigonometry, a sine wave, where it has kind of a swell above the x-axis. And then when it goes below the x-axis, there's a trough. So as you go faster, the bow wave gets bigger and it gets the whole wavelength gets longer 
All right, so, so you have this bow wave in the front part and then you have this trough in the behind it. And as you move faster and faster in water, this bow wave gets bigger, which means drag increases. And we, we talk about in level one how when your speed doubles, bow wave or frontal drag increases eight times. So when you're going faster, it's harder to move through water. And there's ways to, to minimize that. You can't get rid of it, but you can minimize it. Um, but this is, this is why it creates a bow wave. And as you go faster, this bow wave, the front of the bow wave gets higher and the whole, bow, uh, the whole wave itself gets longer. So the wavelength and the amplitude increase as you go faster. So it's going to keep, keep doing that and up to a point at which the total wavelength is as long as the vessel. All right. Or another way of thinking about this is that the front part of that wave, the, 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 the bow wave part, it ends in the mid, it's basically the midpoint before it becomes the trough. That midpoint is the same midpoint as the vessel. And at that point, the vessel actually tilts upward. All right, so at the point at which the wave is long enough and high enough that it's long enough uh, uh, equal to the vessel, that vessel is now going to tip upwards. And now what's happening is trying to climb up the bow wave. And this is the point it has reached its whole speed, H-U-L-L -L speed, whole speed. So this is the point at which it's reached that. And it's trying to climb that bow wave. And it, it, this is a point of diminishing returns for the vessel's power. So basically, if you add more power, right, to go faster, um, all you really get is just a steeper bow wave. And it's higher, it's harder to go up that thing. So you're using tons of energy and you're not really getting that much more speed out of it. So you're kind of maxed out. And this explains why when we're paddling in flat water, we can't really go faster than three and a half miles an hour on a short board or four and a half on a long board. We max out, right? There's just nothing. Like we need some other force to help us get into the wave. Right? So that's, it's the, it's the vessel's whole speed. But, but here's the silver lining. There's ways to cheat whole speed and go faster. One of which I talk about in level one, which is, lengthening the vessel artificially, um, creating an artificial bulbous uh, bow. There's, there's ways within paddling technique that you can cheat whole speed. But also with surfboards, they cheat it through just design, right? Because if you look at a surfboard, a surfboard, it's designed to be a planing vessel. Like look at, if you lay a surfboard just on water and you don't put any weight on it, what does it do? It just, it floats. It's not really displacing a ton of water. It really floats. That's why you have to consider the vessel, you on top of that board, right? So the board itself is designed as a planing vessel, but as soon as you get on it, your added weight may turn it into a fully di displaced vessel or a semi-displaced vessel, which is more like a longboard. Longboards are more semi-displacement vessels just to start with. But but because, because of the, the design of the board, it creates lift. And when you can create lift, you get out of that displacement uh, scenario a lot faster. So for example, like, like I said, with longboards, you kind of start at semi-displaced, but let's take a shortboard, like a low volume, your 26 liter shortboard that you're talking about, right? So let's say that you're on that thing and now you're sprinting, you're sprint paddling in flat water you may become a semi-displacement vessel at that point, maybe touching planing from time to time, maybe, but you can't sustain it, especially without any other added forces. So it's, it's with the other forces, we can reach a speed at which we can, we can overcome what we call whole speed barrier. So imagine this imaginary barrier that you just can't, you can't get through right now without any extra added help and, and it takes an enormous amount of energy to get through that barrier now here's the really cool thing is that once you get through that barrier drag continues to increase as you go faster but at a much drastically slower rate because now you're up out of the water pretty much 
And this this really explains how you can have a four foot board or even a skim board and you can stand on it when you're moving. But if you are at a dead stop, the thing sinks right below the water with your weight, right? So that this is this explains all of this, right? So you know, kind of going back to our original question, how fast do you have to go? You have to go you have to go fast enough to move from displacement to planing. To, to break through that barrier, you need this enormous amount of effort. Um, you can think of watching ski boats um, where they, when they start out, they, you know, start, they plow, like you said, and their bow is really, really high, really, really high. And then once they get to a, sp a certain speed, all of a sudden it flattens out and they fly, right? So that's what we call pulling someone out of the hole or getting your boat out of the hole. And that is basically going from displacement, displacement, displacement to planing, right? And then at that point, everything's super efficient, which is really cool. Um, so kind of getting back to catching a wave then, <laughs> since we can't paddle fast enough to catch up to the wave, we, we need those other forces to help us, right? Um, to get to planing speed. And those other forces are the wave's momentum, as we talked about in episode one, and the inclined plane or gravity, the inclined plane of, of that. So we need those two forces. We need the momentum of the wave moving into the beach and we need gravity. And the, the combination of those two gets us up to that speed. So when, when catching a wave, uh, sprint paddling, here's the benefit sprint paddling at the right moment with the right technique can get you from display displacement to planing can get you out of that hole a split of a second sooner or a split uh, of a moment sooner which means that then instead of waiting to say a 50 degree ramp to catch the wave and catch the gravity to, to go from displacement to planing you're catching it at a 40 degree ramp and depending on the rate of change of that ramp right? That may be a huge advantage. <laughs> it might be uh, a wave that has a, a really fast transition like Chopu where uh, you're just trying to get down. You're starting at 60 degrees and you're just trying to get to your feet and halfway down the dang wave before it goes to 90, right? And so like all these things need to happen. You see it all the time. Surfers don't actually need to paddle. We talked about that in episode one. We don't actually have to paddle to catch waves, but what the paddling does is it gives you again a higher likelihood, a higher probability of making the wave than if you don't. Now, if you don't paddle and you wait to that really steep section where you get enough gravity, enough speed to get you, send you down that wave, your pop-up better be on par. It better be you know tight. And your navigation of the next section down the wave. I, one thing I, I, I work on with a lot of the big wave surfers and I talk a little bit in level two about this with the surfers. When you look at a big wave, you can look at a big wave, at, let's say a 40 foot wave. I don't look at a 40 foot wave. I look at four sections of 10 feet or eight sections of five feet, right? And if you look at a wave as a series of horizontal surfaces with different ramp angles, you start to re realize that one, there's these different horizontal planes that you need to navigate through and negotiate the transitions between those. Like Chopu is very square transition. Um, you have some like Indo, we always talk about how, how perfect Indo waves are, right? They have beautifully smooth transitions, almost like a skate ramp at a lot of spots. It's like that. And that's why we think it's so perfect, so easy to get into the waves there. It's because they have these beautiful transitions, right? So... When you look at a big wave, it's easy to see the different sections, but the same mindset could be said about a small wave. You just, instead of, you know, you could look at a two foot wave and just break it up into half foot increments, you know, four half foot increments. And you're looking at the angles of each of those little increments to determine, is it steep enough to get me up to planing speed? Or do I need to give it those one or two burst strokes to get me in a little bit sooner? Like, do I have enough time before it goes to 90 or past 90 to get to my feet, set my rail and be ready for whatever's going to happen next, right? So, so paddling at the right moment with, especially with correct technique, so you can get the high effectiveness, like what we talked about last week in episode two, I know so many shameless plugs, <laughs> right? So if we, if we do it at the right time with the right technique, 
we can move from displacement to planing a fraction of a second sooner. And that may mean the, the, the difference of the world on whether we make the wave, whether we get an extra turn in the wave, um, a number of things that happen afterwards. One thing that I get asked a lot is like, well, how do I, <laughs> how do I learn this? Like, what can I do to learn this? And I, and I always say, next time you go surf, leave your board in the car or leave it on the beach and just go body surf. Body surf for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Because when you body surf or even body board, you, you will feel, you will physically feel when you go from displacement to planing. Right? And you, you may still just get completely obliterated, but you'll feel what that, what that feels like. And once you get a board under you that is designed with lift incorporated into the design, you'll feel it a lot sooner and you'll be more attuned to feel it sooner. And then you'll know exactly when to pop up, how much more power you need to get to that point of planing. So that's kind of my, my, my two cents. So, I mean, Jim, you, you've been surfing for a long time. Is this all sound familiar to you or is this Greek? Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, you know, but obviously you bring in a lot of analytical stuff to go along with it. I mean, the thing that I kind of like am kind of digesting based off what you just said is, man, there's so many variables to surfboard design. And I'm going to use the answer that you love, Rob. It depends, <laughs> but, you know, um, <laughs> because think about it, like. Um, you could surf like, um, a firewire baked potato. And so like, I might ride a five foot firewire baked potato and it might be like 31 liters of volume or something like that. And I'm just taking a guess. So, but with, so like that said, I would have more, um, natural planing ability compared to a 26 liter shortboard, but I would also, be more likely to maybe track or lose my kind of lateral profile so I might lose some speed there and um, so my vessel inherently would be less long because I might be more likely to overreach on a five foot surfboard versus six one or whatever so um, yeah so I don't know I don't know what the middle ground is but um you know just anecdotally from my own experience, like I'll have, um, I'll have like certain sessions where I'll, I'll drive to the beach and I'll have like a five, five fish. That's like pretty voluminous for me. It's like a 29, 30 liter fish. And then I'll have my high performance short board. That's like 26, 27 liters. And like, I'll just look at waves and know I can get away surfing and catching waves on a high performance board fine. And I can't really articulate why. Like I'll look at it, I'll look at a wave and I'll go, yeah, there's a, it's small. And so the simple mind would go, well, it's small. Therefore I should ride my fish, which you can argue is a high performance board or a good wave board, but let's just say I'll ride my gravel board if it's small and I'll go, yeah, but look at the steep parts of these certain sections. That's like high performance material. Right. Um, and contrary to that you can go to like big steamer lane and it's like super flat some days and in those days i'd rather have my small wave board to give me more like inherent planing so yeah and, and those are things that i just kind of picked up you know just from seeing other guys do it and feeling those feelings um yeah well when you have like a spot where we surf i consider that more of a shortboard wave when the tide is right and the, the reason I call it a shortboard wave is it's more of the rate of change of those ramp angles. Mm -hmm. So that's really what it is. You could still have a very steep wave uh, and every wave will eventually get to that 90 degrees because it, it gets so high that then it spills over. But the rate of change is what I determine. And what you, the calculations in your head, that's what you're doing. You're like, okay, the rate of change right there. Yeah, I can get a pump there. I could, I could take mm -hmm. off right there. Whereas, you know, it's something that's really slow. The rate of change of that, those angles is really slow. You're like, oh, well, I'm going to need a little bit more help mm -hmm. um, and at planing, at getting to planing speed, right? Yeah. And I think that's a really advanced skill to be able to look at a wave and, um, uh, kind of like depict that like 
was it, I, I can't remember if it was you that I was talking to about this, but it's, I've never surfed Bell's Beach, but um, Kelly Slater was talking about the concept of doing um, mid-faced bottom turns at Bell Be Bell's Beach. And the way he kind of had that aha moment, were we talking about this or no? No, but I've, I've, I've heard this. So the way he kind of came at it was, uh, it was really neat to hear him talk about it because obviously he's one of the best slater or best surfers of all time. And he had a session where he went out there and struggled like, you know, it's a bigger wave. And so he's paddling in, getting to the bottom, trying to bottom turn in like having a tough time losing speed and it's not really clicking. And then he like got out of the water and like, I think he was on the beach looking at the wave from the side and realized if you broke that wave into, like you said, compartments that the top compartment was flat and then it had this steep transition in the middle and then it kind of flattened out at the bottom. And so he kind of got to the point where he, you know, I think he explained it as like a chip shot paddle in, drop in and then do this mid faced bottom turn. So like right in that transition before um, kind of plowing into this flat section and trying to bottom turn there. And so it's like, that comes with experience and I think that can probably dictate which board you ride depending on how you see those um, kind of maybe sections broken up within a wave height. Um, but I think, um, does that make sense? Kind of how I explain it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so 100%. I think um, going to your point like of, of this, like, you know, my simple mind is like, well, you got to get like in that hook of the wave to, find that sweet spot. So, um, to, to be able to paddle in and catch something on a short board. Like if you look at that Instagram video of John, John, I mean, it looks like, I mean, it's kind of hard to see cause the camera like pans to him and he's like, it almost looks like he just like did one of these slingshot like kind of things with his board. Yeah. I call that the cork technique. Yeah. Like, yeah, he just cork shot, uh, with his board and maybe did like a dolphin flick of his wrist to get in and next thing you know he's up and like negotiating and I was like I don't think I've ever done that in my life you know and and if you don't surf you don't even you might not even recognize how like incredible that is like um I mean he literally didn't paddle to get into a you know 10 foot wave yeah, yeah. And, and I have a video footage that I show in level two of, of Kai Lenny doing a one paddle takeoff at 30 foot jaws and it's yeah. it's that same principle of finding the ramp the angle and that particular ramp in the john john video in the kaloe video in the kai video those ramps the trans they the rate of change of that section of the wave it was steep enough to get them the gravity they needed the speed they needed to get to planing with very little extra force from them but slow enough to give them time to get to their feet and negotiate the next section down the wave. And so you see, I also have videos of, say, John John getting pitched at mm -hmm. uh, North Point. And so you, there are things you can look for when you look at waves as these series of horizontal planes. There are things to look for in that to say, oh, man, it's very obvious he's going to get pitched right now. Even him, you know, and when he's in the moment, he'll he'll maybe go for it because you don't really know until you're in the moment what that wave's going to exactly do. When you watch the video afterward, you're like, oh yeah, it's very clear that he's going to get pitched. Like I can I can take a I can take a pre pre video clip, a frame, and I can look at the wave at a certain frame before it even happens. I can be like, yeah, this most likely he's going to get pitched just by looking at the wave coming up. I, I, I like what you said about like feeling that on a bodyboard or body surfing. And within that kind of learning curve, you could probably throw into like getting pitched, you know? So like if you've ever been pitched on a, a wave that's been chucking, it's a really like, like it's a really terrible feeling. Yeah. It happens all the time at our spot. Oh, I do it 10 times a second. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's like, you know, that it's happening like before it happens. And there's a feeling of weightlessness um, that I would describe as like, I was too late, right? Like I was, um, if I had just gotten a little, had I positioned myself a little further out before the wave ramped up, I could have harnessed that energy and been under the hook and like 
done it with minimal paddling, but something about my either positioning or angle was just off and I in in the wave got too steep um or too fast for me um so yeah and I would I would even argue you said I was I may have thought I was too late you look at guys like Mason Ho and there's plenty of footage where he's just dropping in under the hook like you said under the hook in midpoint of the wave and taking off with no paddling and getting through there well one might look at that and be like oh well he's taking off way late but it's more about, again, the angle that the wave is at at that point, plus his amazing freakishness of being able to get his feet set and his rail set so quickly, right? So to your point, like when you get pitched, is it a matter of should I have been further out? Or it could have been you should have been further in possibly and not in one of the two. It could have been because you might you, you might want to be on a lower part of the wave. So my, my pitching uh, – kind of philosophy here in theory is when the ramp at the very top has a low ramp angle where you're at, you're not going to catch as much gravity. But if the if the ramp below you is steeper, that's a, that's a recipe for disaster, right? So because you're not getting the speed you need from the lower ramp and the ramp below it is moving already past this angle, the top angle, right? So in this case, you actually want to be down in front of this part. Or further back, as you suggested, and getting in earlier to get down that section. So I, I think you're right in saying you just, in terms of your timing of it, it wasn't correct. But I would say we might be able to argue that you could have been further in or out. Yeah, I guess it, it depends. That's going to be the theme <laughs> of, uh, of my uh, whole spiel on this episode but like take a look at um dude look at um luke davis Do you, uh so that guy is like um he's insane um there is some footage of him and a couple other guys surfing down in panama at a place uh called i think it's silverbacks and they got a they got a big swell and um they kept using this term chip shotting and I love it because it's kind of like what you're describing. It's like that wave like is a mutant, right? Like it's like almost like a reverse chopu in the sense this swell is so big. Like this is so steep that there's no way that like these people could take off here. But there was this kind of other steep or other section higher up on the wave. Yeah, but further out, right? Before that bottom part got really steep. So at that moment of the chip shot, the chip shot was a higher angle at that moment. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. So it had enough pitch to it where you can kind of get in and it looked normal. But then the gnarly part was now they had to be on their board going down this. Right? <laughs> and that's when it was just, I mean, check out the footage on his Instagram if, if you want to see what I'm talking about. But like, I mean, that is all positioning and timing. Um, and, 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 and I think you and I... Um, not to compare us to what they're doing at Silverbacks. There's little kind of micro moments of that at almost any beach break. Um, people might refer to it as a double up or a triple up or whatever. But like there's this kind of chip shot like, oh, this is the easy part to get in here. There's enough um, steepness to this curve to propel me. And if I don't do it now, it's going to be a nightmare doing it like 10 feet from now. Absolutely. You know, and the only way you kind of like feel that is... Um, you mess up and you feel it. <laughs> well, that's and I, that's why I say I suggest body surfing first because there's right. no board involved, and then slowly once you start to feel it body surfing, then incorporate it into smaller waves and try to take fewer and fewer strokes, and time the ramp better to the point where you're getting to the John John, you know, little flutter paddle or the Kaloe flat flutter paddle, and you don't have to. You know, somebody that does that really well at our local break is uh noah yeah he does he does it amazingly well and he uses the lift of his of the rocker of his uh, of the nose of his boards really really well yeah 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 and you know for those kind of like maybe beginner or intermediate surfers listening like you know if we kind of had to relate this to um, motor learning so like what do people how do people learn like one thing that I've kind of picked up, and this goes more to like the cultural cultural component of our sport, is sometimes we're afraid to ask. 
right? We, we, we don't want to get labeled as a kook. Uh, you know, we go home with our tail between our legs because we got pitched 10 times. But the problem with that kind of like belief or um, behavior is we don't learn. And so we keep doing it. And so I'd rather like get pitched 10 times and go back on the beach with my tail between my legs and go, what can I take away from that? What was I doing right? And what was I doing wrong? And then sit on the beach and just observe, be an observer. Look at, look at guys and girls doing it well and, and ask ourselves, what's the difference between what they're doing and what I'm doing? And little like aha moments I've picked up over the years. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm a borderline competent surfer. I'm not the best. I'm not the worst. But like one thing that I kind of picked up for my own personal growth was I don't necessarily need to be the best or the most skilled surfer. I just got to know where to sit at this break to catch the waves the easiest. Because if I sit in the wrong spot, um, it's just not going to go as well. And so like if I'm surfing a new spot, like let's just say in Santa Cruz and there's a ton of spots that it's crowded, I'm going to observe the playing field, right? But I'm also going to take note of what really good guys are doing. Not necessarily so much how they're surfing, but how they got into that wave. Because getting on, being on the wave and riding, that's the easy part, I, I think. I think positioning, timing, and takeoff, that's like, you know, so nuanced with each spot. And, and, and just being an observer and, and being humble and going, okay, like, how's that going to look when I'm out there? Do, like, do I need to sit there or do I need to sit there? Or is there a radius where I can sit and kind of get away with um, some wiggle room before the wave gets to a point where I'm just going to get pitched if I try to be in that spot. It's amazing. I want someone to hook up uh, a brain scan to surfers as they catch waves because there's so many calculations going on. It's insane. And as you're learning as a beginner or intermediate, there's even more. And and for you and I, a lot of it's subconscious movement um, at that point. So very, very cool, man. we're we're getting to the to the last section uh, because I know you and I can talk for ages on this and we will. Yeah. We have lots more we episodes. We didn't even talk hopefully. about what we wanted to talk about. We're just like <laughs> just endless. I'm no, looking at the is, time going dang. Well, so that's why we're doing this podcast man, because we just trip <laughs> out on what the each what we each other saying and um you know, uh, that's, it's all good, man. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, so last segment is, uh, I like to call, can I get a ride? Um, and these are just a quick memory from your early days starting out. They could be something that could help somebody it could be just a happy memory or a sad memory or <laughs> something like that. But just give us, you know, one memory from your early days of surfing. Cause we've all been there. We've all started kind of at the beginning. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I grew up surfing in Marin, and um, I, you know, my very first um, surf craft was a was a. At the time, I called it a boogie board, but since then, I've learned you don't call them boogie boards; you call them body boards. So I had a um, a Mori Boogie Mach Seven body board, and it was bright yellow on the top and bright orange on the bottom, and I spent a lot of time um, out at our local um, Stinson Beach when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, uh, doing some bodyboarding because my grandfather lived out there. And so, um, like, I guess that's like the roots of my surfing. And, um, I guess so much of what kind of keeps me connected surfing is like, I still feel like I'm on a Mach 7 bodyboard. Um, do you still have that? Do you still have that board? I don't. I am, um, uh, tragic, but you know, um, apropos to that. So, so, Got rid of the Mach 7, ended up getting a stand-up surfboard, and it was a it was a really clunky shortboard that uh, my mom had like picked up at a, a garage sale, and uh, it was a 6.2 Newport, which no one will know. And then um, I rode it for a few years, got a little bit better at surfing, and then um, put it up on uh, or sold it in the garage sale, and then saw it up on Craigslist like three years ago. And I was like, holy cow, that's my weird surfboard I had 20 whatever years ago. And um, I know it because of how weird of a board it was and where the logos were placed. And it had the same stickers in the same spots. So I had a um, a Marin Surf Sports. Now I'm dating myself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember Marin, Marin Surf Sports back in Larkspur Landing? Oh, yeah. 
I had a surf sports sticker on it and uh and that sticker was still on it and no so way. Con- yeah the guy was selling it for like 30 dollars, and i was like it was up in santa rosa and i was like i gotta get this like back in my in my life you know and um uh emailed the guy and it had already sold but i was like man i was so close to like reacquiring my first surfboard ever. oh tragic again <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um yeah i think um you know if if i kind of can share just like a quick um story to kind of tie in like maybe just how complicated things are and like socially and psychologically like i almost stopped surfing when i was um 13 uh, years old it was the summer before high school so i was 13 maybe 14 years old and so i had like this bodyboard um surf surfing experience at Stinson Beach which is uh for those of you who don't know kind of like where y- you start and then it was my first session graduating to our more advanced um break that we regularly surf but when you're 13 or 14 years old and it's your first time and you don't know much um like it- it's a really daunting kind of graduated type of step and um and had a really rough session, like got really panicked and I was with my buddy and his dad and, and I, I had just never up to that point in time felt flutter and fear like that. And I remember, um, being really scared and putting the board, putting my belly on the board and going in and just sitting on the beach, uh, feeling so defeated. And up to this point for like years being in the ocean, I had never been like scared. It, it had always been fun. And I said, I'm never doing this again, <laughs> you know, um, I'm never going to do this again because, um, I thought I was going to die and, uh, the ocean's too powerful and I'm never going to do this again. And so I took months off. I think I, I almost went that whole summer never surfing again or not surfing after that and, um, eventually got over it and, you know, um, calculated my risk if we kind of had to tie it back to Todd Hargrove and, and from that um, got more confident. So I overcame this little, you know, fearful moment. And from that kind of had a one up on other people that didn't surf. Right. Like, and I think we, whether you identify yourself as a surfer or not, is kind of a different conversation, but like, you know, I think one thing surfers can maybe share in common is like, maybe we have a one up on people that don't surf because surfing gives us confidence. Um, indirectly in other aspects of our life and it's part of the reason where we might get drawn back to doing it right like at least I could say that for myself and then uh flash forward two years I saw a great white shark at Stinson Beach in August and um and uh while I was surfing and and I said you know it was kind of the same deal um I had caught a wave and um, now I'm standing in the shallow, shallows and I'm getting ready to get back on my board to go back out um, to where I had been sitting to catch another wave. And, you know, this fin is trolling right across where I had been sitting. And and uh, it was really scary and I've never seen anything like it before. Um, I've seen I've seen a handful of sharks. I've seen four white sharks in my life, but this was the first one I'd ever seen. And again, I sat on the beach, my mom was there and man, I don't think I surfed for six, seven months after that. And again, it's that like, it's that psychological component. So overcoming that fear and, um, kind of have to having to answer to yourself those own questions on why are you, why are you being afraid does something to your, um, I think personality that transpires in other aspects of life which is why surfing is so cool and which is why as a physical therapist I like I love getting people confident in themselves with movement because I think back to these two like pivotal moments in my maybe early surfing experiences and I go those moments are were moments I wanted to give up and never do this again but there was something so alluring about surfing I had to overcome these fears to get back into doing it and um and i think that does something really um really uh powerful to your physiology and your biopsychosocial model and it makes you more resilient so nice i like it 
I don't know how to follow up to that. That was so deep and yeah. And... <laughs> what about you, man? Like, yeah. um, because you grew up surfing here in Marin, which is like kind of a tough place to. It's a really tough place to start, especially and... especially back then. In you know, in our age group, like surfing wasn't like it is now. Like now, I'm like an old man. Get off my lawn, but. Um, surfing back then was kind of like fringe punk rock yeah it was the the equipment was terrible i i body surfed a lot growing up um i would say that that was what my brother and i did the most when we go down in santa cruz or go to stinson and i didn't get i didn't start um surfing on a on a hard surfboard until 13 12 13 so it took a while for me to kind of get to that stage but I remember up here, I didn't progress nearly much at all. I couldn't get a ride to the beach half of the time. But I also didn't progress much because we were in that Kelly Slater age of potato chip boards and I had the wrong board for for learning. My mom was dating, and this is my early memory, um, my mom was dating a guy that lived in San Diego. So prior to ninth grade, we uh, packed up the car, my mom and I. My brother was already at college. Packed up the car, we drove south, and we stopped at Pismo, and we stopped at Ventura, and then we made it all the way down to, to San Diego, and we spent the whole entire summer in San Diego. And I remember I wasn't a huge fan of the guy, so I didn't want to really hang out at his house. So I just asked my mom, hey, can you just drop me off at the beach and pick me up at the end of the day? Right. And I'll just take care of myself, you know, and I brought a little snack, a little water, towel and my wetsuit and my board. And that was it. And for it was like 35 days straight. I just spent every day at the beach and it was at South Carlsbad State Beach. She dropped me off and it had this great little reform. So it would break on the outside and it would reform on the inside. So I'd catch the white water and then I pop up and it would reform into a wave and I got to surf the wave itself on the reform and work my pop up. And I, I remember like that consistency was so important to my progression because after that summer, the next summer I didn't, I was so involved with water polo that I didn't, I was doing junior Olympics that next summer. I was, I was barely ever surfing and you could see me completely degrade and, and go backwards in progression until I got that consistency back. And it's like, I, that's why I talk to my golfing friends. I don't golf, but golfing is all about consistency. Surfing, when you're learning, it's all about consistency. I remember uh, coming back after that summer, I went surfing at Bolinas and I was dropping in this wave and a friend of mine who had seen me at the beginning of the summer, he surfed a ton and I'm taking off on this wave and driving down the line. Like, well, I wasn't driving, but I was like trimming down the line. I thought I was driving. And I remember the look on his face going, whoa, he's, he's so much better now. And I, dude, I felt so good, right? But it was just, it was consistently. I had nothing I did other than just, just plowing away at it again and again and again. So, you know, if you're starting out, just go. Just just keep getting out there, whether it's a good or bad experience, just keep that consistency up and you're going to make it through it. Yeah, no, that, that's really, um, that's really awesome. And I'm going to just kind of add something into that. Um, <clears throat> I was reading a uh, surfer magazine, which I think, um, is primarily online now, but I'm a bit old school. So they deliver the magazine still to my house, like quarterly now, nice. not every month, like they used to. And there was a really good story about Wade Goodall in there. And Wade Goodall, for those of you that don't know, is, is a really, um, really amazing free surfer. I mean, he's kind of like, like a, a Dane Reynolds type where he's just doing these crazy, um, aerials and innovative of maneuvers and just amazing and and he shares his story in there on how he gets injured and how he couldn't surf um i think for like he got injured once and he couldn't surf for like six months to a year and i think he got re-injured with the same issue and was another like six months to a year and and he made a comment in there that i should have wrote down but i promised to butcher every quote and reference i i was giving this episode but he talks about how he like went back to the basics and started bodyboarding 
and started seeing waves in different ways that he hadn't seen in a long time. And and when he got back up on his stand-up paddleboard when he was like, you know, rehabbed and whatnot, like he, it led to more creativity because he was looking at waves a slightly different way. And I really, I think that's like, I, I take a lot of like curiosity in that and like given your recommendation, if you want to feel that steepness, get on a, ba- a bodyboard or a, you know, body surf or whatever it might be. But like, even as advanced surfers, so you're talking about one of the most advanced surfers in the world got something metorically out of going back to the basics yeah. and bodyboarding, you know? And, um, so it, it, again, it's about that feeling and learning about where the steep sections are in the wave. And, um, I think, um, you combine that with practice and, and again, being an observer, stepping back and maybe like analyzing what you could do different. Um, and I think you commented on that once about like your intent with practice versus just like bad practice. You know, you and I have talked about that. Like practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And so every time I surf, I try to pick up something and the the natural ceiling effect as you get more advanced is you'll probably pick up less and less, but those little things you do pick up kind of might take it to the next level. And I would argue that people that have plateaued for 10 years in their surfing might not be the best observers, right? Yeah. They might not be the best students of the sport yeah. because you can only train so much. You can only get so strong, right? But like all these other things you can do, um, you know, kind of like we're talking about here might take you to a different level. Not, you know, that's what kind of keeps me going too. Yeah. So that's a cool story. I like that. Thanks for sharing that, man. I, um, my camera just died. <laughs> I'm not even joking. <laughs> the, the, the camera Is the just audio shut still down. going or no? And I, I don't know. Going? Maybe we should no. split this into two episodes. This is, this was a lot of fun, uh, but we do Super need to fun. go. My kid has a, a trumpet lesson in three minutes. Yeah, let's get you out of here. Um, so so well, we're going to have to end if we don't want trumpet. Um, I'm yeah, recording, man, that's awesome. So, so um, thanks, guys, so much for watching. Really, really appreciate it. Let us know how we're doing. Shoot us an email. Um, if you want us to talk about something specific, let us know. You know, we're open to suggestions. We've got a ton of ideas, but uh, as always, we are open to helping you guys. That's why we do this. And also, it's kind of a little fun for us. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, and we'll Bye, see you next week.